Good afternoon, and this is Italo Zeni from uh, the Center for Wireless Communications. And it will be very tough to talk about what I'm going to talk about now after hearing uh, about climate change and global warming and Earth Overshoot Day and people lacking, um, you know, basic needs and uh, basic resources. But I'll try at least to connect to the sustainability aspect. Okay, my slides are here. So, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is this title. It might sound a bit fancy, but you can remove the multi-antenna part for now. So, communications, wireless communications, and energy efficiency challenges at terahertz frequencies. So, as I come from the Center for Wireless Communications, I work in wireless communications, obviously. And that means in the intersection of communication theory and signal processing. Communication theory is the branch of, let's say, mathematics that tells you how fast you can transmit data, basically. That's very reductive definition, but it's quite basic and I think it's good enough for, for today. So some data here about impact of ICT technologies. So ICT, Information Communication Technologies, are responsible for a terrible amount of the world's electricity consumption. Well, there are contrasting data. Maybe companies tend to be, be a bit optimistic. Also, it's a bit old, but now the load of data has increasing, increased exponentially. So we have between 4% and 10%. In 2020, this is data from Finnish Ministry of transportation and communications. So this is still a huge amount of electricity that is used in ICT sector. So I believe it comes just after transportation industry and especially food industry and factories. So there's a lot to do. Of course, we all want to communicate fast, reliably, with low latency, with huge amount of definition for whatever application we want, and this costs a lot of energy. Luckily, there's room for improvement, so I'm going to talk about some very brief introduction about this MIMO technology. So MIMO means multiple input, multiple output, is basically a communication from many antennas to many antennas. And why is this important? Well, it is important because it allows you to communicate parallel data streams at the same time frequency resource. Normally, if you had to communicate different data messages, you would do it in time, different time slots, or different frequencies at the same time. Well, here you can do at the same time frequency resource. You just separate the data stream in space, and that's what multiple antennas allow you to do. And actually, this might sound fancy, but this has been around for at least 25 years, perhaps, and it's present in many of the technologies that you have today, from Wi-Fi to 4G, although some basic form of it. And it's actually one of the main building blocks of today's 5G. And of course, it will be also present in beyond generations. So what does this mean? That you have, for example, a single base station, could be right outside this hotel, that is serving several users in the same time frequency resource. So if I'm trying to communicate something to you, for example, and at the same time I'm trying to communicate something to Sanna, at the same time, you will receive your useful message plus some interfering message that is actually intended for her, plus some noise, and this is the basic principle of any wireless communication channel, so this is very basic. And what happens here is that this is possible thanks to multiple antennas. Multiple antennas allow you to transmit several streams at the same time frequency resource. It happens, however, that if you increase this number of antennas to a very large number and you obtain the so-called massive MIMO uh, technology, you are able to do so in a more efficient and also energy efficient manner. And there's a contradiction here, apparently. So massive MIMO means increasing the number of antennas, but I'm also telling you that you can uh, increase the energy efficiency, so basically transmit the same amount of data with the same energy consumption, well, this is exactly it. And 
I will show this with this figure here. So on the left, you see a single antenna system that basically is not able to focus the signal power in any spatial direction. It's one antenna. It just transmits isotropically. If I multiply the number of antennas, here I have 10, I can create a beam with more energy in the direction of the user of, uh, of interest and with lower side lobes, which means lower dispersion of energy. Okay, so this is basic principle. And you can intuitively understand that if I increase this number, for example, to 100, then I can obtain a very focused beam in the direction of interest with very low side lobes and also very low interference. So you, at the same time, you save energy because most of the energy is directed in the direction of the user of interest. And also you save energy for the user. And at the same time, you reduce the interference to other users. So that's a double positive effect. So of course, that's great because the energy efficiency in terms of transmit power now is basically, as you can see here, the power received by this, the user when I increase the number of antennas from 1 to 100 has increased by a factor of 100, so 20 dB. That's great, but the problem is that these antennas must be supplied with power. So it's not just the transmit power, the, the power that you transmit over the air. It's also the power that you need to supply these antennas. And these antennas come at some expensive technological limits. But here, just to show you that this massive MIMO, which is a building block of today's communications, is not so massive. Well, this happy dude here is holding this limited size base station. And here there are 64 antennas. And this is for a frequency of 6 gigahertz, or sub-6 gigahertz, which is the basic frequency of 5G. 5G will have higher frequencies, but that will only help in terms of size of the antennas, because the higher the frequencies, the smaller the antennas, the more antennas you can pack in the same area. So given the diverse audience today, I limited the amount of math to one formula. So consider yourself lucky. But this is important to understand because there is a need to transmit a lot of data to all these users. Everybody wants more data and wants faster. So how do you do so? Well, there is a very basic principle which is called channel capacity if you want or achievable rate, which is given by this very simple formula. This comes already from basically 1948 from the equivalent of the Nobel Prize of Information Theory, who came up with this formula that gives you the basic or the fundamental limit of data transmission. So, well, this is the basically SINR, signal to interference plus noise ratio. So it's a useful signal divided by everything else. But this is just inside a logarithm, so it grows very slowly at some point, it goes like this. So you can do all the tricks that you want, to improve this, but this is not sufficient. What do you have in front? This is the bandwidth, okay? So more bandwidth, more data that I can transmit per second. But more bandwidth means that you need to increase the carrier frequency of the system. Increasing the carrier frequency of the system is expensive in terms of components, RF components, and in terms of the power that you need to supply these components, okay? so. It's again a trade-off. We want more, but this is going to be more power consuming and also perhaps not very sustainable if we do things the way that we've been doing things so far. So as I mentioned, the frequency used in uh, uh, 5G mostly is this sub six gigahertz. This might not tell you much, but just to put things into perspective, it's about twice or three times the frequency previously used in 4G. So that's not such a big deal because actually, eventually, the frequencies in 5G will increase to this FR2, frequency range 2, up to 50 plus gigahertz, which is huge increase compared to the past. But this is not all, because this is not sufficient for our needs. We want more, we want to serve more users at the same time, we need more bandwidth. More bandwidth means you have to increase the carry frequency, so we want to explore the sub-terahertz or even terahertz frequencies. 
So that's going to cause huge, a huge shift, a paradigm shift in terms of our communication systems that we know today. So the first thing that you need to know is that higher operating frequencies are necessary to have more bandwidth, but higher operating frequencies require larger antenna arrays. So it means increasing the number of antennas that you have here, for example. 100 is not enough anymore. You may need thousands. So that you can already see the problem. The first problem is that this becomes a power-limited communication. Before, in lower frequencies, we had a bandwidth-limited communication. Now, increase the frequency, the bandwidth is not a problem anymore, but the energy or the power consumption becomes a problem. And, of course, to solve this, you need radical simplifications in the radio frequency architecture. The second effect is that you go from far field to near field communications. And again, if any of you have taken any signal propagation course, you would know that there is a difference between near field and far field. But actually, this is a complication, but it can also be a benefit, as I will illustrate later. The third effect here is that the communication becomes more line of sight. And what does this mean? It means that before, if I wanted to say something to Katya right here, <laughs> I could reach her by this direct path, but also through scattering. So basically the signal bounces, if you will, allow me to say that, bounces over the materials in the surrounding elements and reaches her again. So she could be reached through multiple paths. And that's a good thing because you can exploit that. Unfortunately, when you increase the frequency, this is no longer possible because as you increase the frequency, the wavelength decreases and this becomes comparable to the smoothness or the, the texture of the materials around. So it gets absorbed and stuck there. So you need to reach users mostly through line of sight communications and that's a disadvantage. So why is a transmitter or receiver so complicated when you increase the number of antennas? Well, this is a very basic architecture of a receiver. I'm not an RF guy. I don't know much about RF, but this is just the basic, so it's okay to talk about this. So we have here several users transmitting to a base station, which has M antennas, and these M antennas should be very large, a very large number. Each of these antennas normally is connected to a very power consuming and complex RF frequency chain which is connected to very expensive and power consuming components, which are ADCs, which means analog to digital components. When I send a signal through air, it's an analog signal, but then it reaches the antennas, it must be converted to digital signal in order to process the information. Okay, so whatever you receive in your phone after the antennas becomes digital and then it's processed. So in, you need to convert it to digital domain. Unfortunately, all these are very expensive and power consuming. And actually, the consumption of these elements here, which are apparently simple, is quite overwhelming because it grows exponentially with the number of bits of resolution. So higher resolution, you increase the, exponentially the power consumption of this. And also increases linearly with the bandwidth. So if you want to increase the bandwidth to communicate more data per second, this increases too the power of consumption of these components. So this is not sustainable. Well, one way that we have used and we are currently using in 5G is this hybrid analog to digital architecture, which basically has a compromise here. You still keep the number of antennas very large, but then you replace, let's say, one RF chain and a pair of ADCs for each antennas with some phase shifters. So you can reduce the number of these components. Well, unfortunately, this is fine for millimeter wave frequencies, which are high frequencies of 5G, but then it becomes not scalable for, for higher frequencies. So one possible solution that you have here is to use the original fully digital architecture where you have RF chain per antenna, but then you lower the resolution of these components. And this is actually something that works really well. And surprisingly, even if these components have one bit resolution. One bit resolution means that you can only observe zero or one, or if you will, plus one, minus one. 
So it's a very coarse. From all the spectrum, continuous spectrum, you only receive plus one, minus one. That's terrible. However, if you combine the signals, these plus one, minus ones, from many, many, many antennas, it turns out that you can actually obtain very good results. And you reduce these components to the simplest possible form that they can assume. And actually, uh, adopting one-bit ADCs is potentially a great way to, to decrease exponentially the power consumption and the complexity of base stations and also mobile phones in this case. And because one-bit ADCs or one-bit data converters are the simplest and cheapest and least power consuming data conversion devices that you can ever obtain. And of course, you can simplify the RF design. I'm not going to go into these details, but simplifying the RF design also simplifies the, the power consumption. Okay. For example, you don't need to increase the power to operate in this linear region of the power amplifiers, which consumes a lot of power. You can actually reduce the power consumption. Also, a positive impact or a positive consequence of using this one-bit ADCs, one-bit data conversion, is that you don't need to operate with very high power. Normally, or traditional communication systems, the higher the power, the higher this so-called signal-to-noise ratio, and this is good. Here, you can observe that as you increase this power, the situation is bad. This is a constellation that you transmit, and here you can more or less distinguish the symbols at the receiver. As you increase the power, you see that these symbols kind of collapse and you are not able to distinguish them anymore. That's bad. So it means that you can actually operate in a low power regime. Okay, so this is another advantage. By the way, I forgot to say that massive MIMO concept is one of the rare, very rare concepts that have made it from a wild theoretical idea to, to a product in about 10 years. So this paper, who kind of invented Massive MIMO, is from 2010. In 2020, it was already implemented in 5G. Okay? So what we do here with this all complicated math that we have behind that is not illustrated here actually works. And this is not just to provide higher data rates, but also has the potential to increase the energy efficiency of the systems. Okay, so we've seen that we can actually exploit the inherent, let's say, simplicity of these devices to decrease exponentially the, 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 the whole power consumption of, of wireless systems. So this is, this is great, but of course there's a lot of research that needs to be done to put these systems into, into practical use. And that's what we're working on. The second aspect of increasing the carrier frequency, if you recall, is that you go from this so-called far field to this near field. What does it mean? Well, in practical terms, it means that if I'm transmitting again to Katya and I'm very far from her, the waves of my signal will kind of be plane waves, like flat. If I go very close, she will see some kind of spherical waves. And this might not make such a big difference to you because this is just some electromagnetic property, but actually it does make a difference. Because here, when you beamform some power towards the user, well, the focal point is infinity if you are in the far field. That means that everything that is in the direction of my communication beam will be shot by this energy beam. So this is a waste of energy, creates interference, and so on. On the other hand, if you are in this so-called near field, well, the focal point happens or takes place in a specific distance, not just angular direction, but also a specific distance. And this allows you to place users, for example, here and here without interference. If I have users in the far field in this direction, all of them will be interfering users, will be suffering this interference because they receive unnecessary power and so on. Instead here, well, you can place users that are not receiving any interference, and so you can create, basically, a sphere of energy around the user of interest. 
with evident advantages in terms of energy efficiency and interference reduction. So basically the difference here, I've already illustrated that in the traditional far field communications, you have a beam towards the user, everything in between or after the user will be also overwhelmed by, by interference. Also, you have some side lobes that are creating interference and waste of energy. All this is a waste of energy. Instead, in the near field, you can create a sphere of interference around the user of interest. And also these this very small antennas, well, not necessarily small, but they could be small but electrically large because the frequency is high, that they can be integrated into construction elements such as facade of a building or a roof of a stadium or so on. And this actually, by increasing the number of antennas per unit of area, allows to reach theoretically the asymptotic limits of massive MIMO that so far we haven't achieved due to these side lobes and so on. So these are exciting problems, and this brings me to talk a bit about, about sustainability. So of course there are lots of uh, interesting problems from the point of view of research and we have to always have energy efficiency and low complexity in mind because that's the way to have scalability when we are many people in the same place, so dense scenarios. Also have essential connectivity in remote areas, long battery durations that all, we all want and also hopefully environmental benefits. Well, there are some uh, techniques that are envisioned in 5G, sorry, 6G, there are the so-called smart radio environments where the propagation can be entirely controlled and you are not actually reacting to the propagation. You can control the propagation so that everything behaves in a controlled way. And of course, there are so many exciting problems, but perhaps I would like to conclude with some general reflections. So I belong to this communication theory community and I was trained in math and signal processing to achieve the, let's say, the theoretical limits of communications or to get very close with low complexity. And the best we can do as communication theorists, if we work alone, is, okay, have fun with our problems, which are very interesting, by the way, but they are quite meaningless if we don't collaborate with other communities. And every community thinks that, okay, we're tackling the most important problem already, so why should I collaborate with others? Well, I've realized that that's something very wrong about our community and probably about every research community. So we should definitely collaborate with RF design community, with electromagnetic theory community, to actually understand these problems and tackle these problems from a comprehensive point of view. And from the point of view of sustainability, that is a big challenge. Because, for example, I have no idea how the base stations are built, what materials and the effect of disposing of those materials in 10 years when the technology is old. So we should actually collaborate more with these communities so that we can actually have some impactful research. And these topics that I've just touched upon are treated in several projects uh, supported by SIGG ESS, Academy of Finland and European Union. Thank you for your attention.